Hello, thank you for your talk, first of all. Uh, it was really insightful. Uh, my question is about the recent points that you've been making about decentralization, democratization of, of this mm -hmm. whole energy transition thing. And I was wondering, we, because we had the chance to work on um, local renewable energy cooperatives, yeah. Enercoop being one of those, um, and we've seen that there are so many challenges. It's not only about generation aspect of it, but also the bureaucratic challenges in a country like this in France where you have this crazy monopolistic centralized mm -hmm. and excessive uh, trust on nuclear uh, uh, energy supply. So how do you see the potentials of, of cooperatives uh, in France and to what, extent, to what extent do you actually include in your scenarios uh, the um, contributions do, do they, they could make. Uh, I was wondering about that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, our, our scenario describes changes in a physical way. So we, we, we just come with numbers about how many uh, wind farms, how many uh, photovoltaic farms, uh, and or, uh, and or uh, rooftops photovoltaics and so on, we get by 2030, by 2050. Um, we, are, we are not, um, I mean, we are, we, we are not using the scenario to make uh, conclusions on the kind of, uh, of development scheme or industrial scheme that would be needed. Um, I mean, we, we kind of leave it open. I mean, we are happy in a way if those players that advocate for EDF remaining uh, monopoly uh, think of ways for EDF to deliver on that kind of scenario. For the case being, for the, for the time being, it's not the case. Uh, so for the time being, we think that developing uh, renewables on a local level uh, would be uh, much more effective than trying to develop renewables through the existing um, existing system. Um, and I mean, we, we 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 we've seen in Denmark, in Germany, for instance, how these local schemes, this cooperative or at least uh, um, uh, citizens' investments related uh, schemes are effective both in speeding up the development and, uh, and, and making it uh, much more uh, accepted by, uh, by, by local populations and players and, and also probably uh, is more efficient to develop those projects in ways that are more sustainable altogether. Um, so we, yeah. I mean, we, 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 we think that more of that is needed and we think that, I mean, some democratic processes are needed and the current situation with EDF and the monopoly is obviously not democratic. I mean, when <laughs> just in, in, in uh, I mean, no, no longer than two months ago, I mean, you have RTE, which is the uh, electric grid operator, which delivers a uh, report commissioned by the government or, or due under uh, uh, legal requirements uh, by RTE. This report, for the first time, endorses the idea that 100% renewables by 2050 is an option, is possible, shows that it's not that different from uh, a, a scenario where you build new reactors in terms of overall costs. So, I mean, it, it should open a debate, but then a few weeks later, the, the, the president says, okay, for the first time, France is going to start a new, react new reactors program. Um, and I mean, we, we've seen that so many times in French history that uh, there are opening of debates there are opening of possibilities, and then the nuclear lobby says, okay, no, we've, we, we, we stop discussing, this is a decision. Um, so, I mean, <coughs> I, I, I don't, I mean, there, there are many possible options for 
democratic process to unlock this situation. Um, but uh, as long as we are stuck with that lobby, with, I mean, uh, <laughs> the, the, what comes back to my mind is uh, uh, Jean-Bernard Lévy, CEO of EDF, um, back in 2018 in a parliament hearing, uh, he said EDF is like someone cycling. We need to keep the wheel turning to avoid falling. Um, and he said, he said so after he explained that EDF needs to build new reactors. Um, so it's, it, yeah, uh, I, I don't know the English uh, for uh, fuite en avant. Do you, um, well, but I mean, yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a kind of track that they could not get out of uh, and that leaves no room for any kind of democratic process, whether it's on a national level like the uh, Citizens' Convention for Climate or a local level through uh, citizens' involvement in, uh, in concrete projects, for instance. Questions? Thank you for the talk. Um, so you actually already answered the question that I wanted to ask ah. you. Um, as soon as uh, I saw uh, Peter's and Donara question, are we acting radically enough and are we acting fast enough? I was going to ask, maybe we are acting too radically and too fast. And I was going to give the example of the automotive industry and e-mobility. Exactly the point that you make is that um, uh, I think that everybody in this classroom already knows that because of this fit, fit for 55 package by 2035, we may not see the IC vehicles anymore. But what came as a revelation to me is that it may happen as early as 2030, uh, in part because of those uh, Euro 7 standards for CO2 uh, emissions. So indeed, um, that means that we don't have, well, by we, I probably mean the automakers, they don't really have that much time to, to change their businesses to, uh, to produce just electric vehicles. And uh, recently, the uh, Nissan, Mitsubishi and Renault Alliance released their roadmap for 2030. And Renault are going to become, they, they say that they will become by 2030 a 100% electric vehicle company. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how feasible that is. Their uh, president was very joyous when he was talking about it. I don't know if that's part of the image that they need to maintain when making such announcements. However, I'm very skeptical about the possibility of doing that, of, of going 100% electric by 2030. And uh, for several reasons. First of all, electric vehicles are more expensive than the conventional vehicles yeah. on average by 10,000 euros. That means that there is a uh, danger of putting the cost of this green transition on the economically vulnerable populations. Um, then there is the problem of electric chargers, as you said, and there is also the problem of inequalities. I don't remember the exact numbers, but let's say like every 40 kilometers in Denmark, they have a fast charger. In Poland, it's like 400 kilometers. So um, my question is, when it seems that it's impossible to have a proper green transition in mobility sector with the uh, with all the radical and drastic legislations that are now being negotiated and put in place don't you think that maybe we need to act um, so as to change the behavior uh, and the way that we use mobility like banning the usage of personal transport altogether in, in cities or in city centers at least by somehow promoting sharing mobility in more, uh, what's the word? I don't know, like to push, push for it really mm -hmm. aggressively. That's what the word. 
that's yeah, the well, word I was looking for. I mean that. That's the question. Thank you. Well, that that's up to the point. Um, the uh, and, and and that reminds me of your comment about transition or addition. Um, and I, I, I like some of the things that uh, Frissot uh, is, is writing right now, uh, also reminding us, for instance, that, um, that nuclear power was introduced uh, at the beginning in the 50s in the US as a, as a kind of cornucopian promise, you know, that it would at some point substitute to fossil fuels to help maintaining the uh, uh, the uh, abundance uh, society of the, the I mean the American uh, way of life, as uh, George Bush father said at some point in uh, climate uh, negotiation, that it was not up for to, to be negotiable. Uh, <coughs> we, we we when when we think about transition. Or, or, I mean, climate urgency, or planetary boundaries, more uh, generally. Um, that calls for uh, sunset policies, uh, and not only sunrise policies. I mean, there, there are things we need to develop, but there are things we need to phase out. And that is something policymakers are really not up to. Um, and they are not up to because they are uh, most of the time dependent on economic incumbent. Um, and that is the case with mobility. Um, the, uh, the, the way the narrative is built on change in mobility that would fit climate objectives is broadly to sell us the idea that we just need to change from a thermal motor to an electric motor without changing anything else and that it's going to work. Uh, obviously it's not going to work for many of the reasons you said um, and so if, if we want to meet climate objectives we do need electric vehicles but we do need to seize the opportunity of a change of equipment to develop a change of behavior. And electric vehicles, I mean, should be an opportunity to shift away from the dependency on individual familiar, uh, fam family vehicle that is the core of our relationship to cars. Uh, we need, I mean, households need to have a car, or maybe even two, or in some cases three, uh, and they need that car for most of their mobility, uh, which means I uh, already mentioned that it's really poorly used, uh, uh, it's poorly designed for the use that is made of it. Uh, but so, so we, we, we could uh, use the, uh, the, uh, the, the fact that uh, electric vehicles emerge on the market to change, to go for much more sharing practices of you know, sharing smaller electric vehicles in uh, urban areas, for instance, and so on. That would call for a change in business models of car makers that is not only to change their manufacturing lines, which is challenging, uh, but to change the number of cars they are selling, I mean, to, to change the whole market. And they don't want that. What they want is being subsidized to develop new manufacturing lines to sell electric vehicles. And they don't even want to cope with different type of vehicles. I uh, told you that uh, we, uh, I mean, in, in, in our scenario, we, uh, uh, we have 70% of cars that are full, full electric, 30% roughly that are 
uh, hybrid green gas uh, based vehicles and we think that's needed for uh, uh, long distances for instance uh, one of the uh, arguments that we are given against this idea is that um, car makers can't develop at the same time uh, manufacturing lines for full electric vehicles and for uh, gas hybrid vehicles. They just don't want it. They want to sell us electric vehicles with exactly with in, in, in the same way as they, are, they have been selling uh, big uh, thermal vehicles. So, yeah, that, I mean, you, you're completely right. Sorry, I'm being long again, but you're completely right that we need to shift from that kind of, I mean, the way the uh, debate is captured by uh, those uh, vested interests. And that is where sufficiency comes in. Just a quick follow-up question. Yes, completely agree with everything that you said. But um, are the European Union lawmakers, to your knowledge, are they even thinking in that direction? Is there any hope at all? Well, um, yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> no, they, I mean, to some extent, they are not aware of this kind of complexity. Um, I mean, the, the, the incumbents, I mean, you, you, you can see the same nowadays for electric vehicles or for hydrogen or I mean that I mean some hype is created that captures the attention of policymakers and they are kind of falling in the trap of you know setting very simple straightforward objectives um, I mean if you set an objective like 100% electric cars uh, new cars on the market by 2030. I mean, uh, um, citizens, I mean, either they don't care or they are concerned with climate and they will be happy. So the only, the only uh, players that could oppose it are the car makers. Once the car makers agree with it, okay, you just, as a police maker, you just don't have to think further. It's going to be okay. It, 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 the image is positive and so on. We are, yeah, we, 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 we have to face that kind of, uh, of, of problem. Um, this all together comes with, and that is also uh, maybe a part of the, uh, uh, of the discussion you raised with the uh, German example. Um, a, a lot of people, a lot of policymakers, a lot of NGOs, even in the, uh, on, on the uh, European scene, uh, call for uh, uh, a high uh, shift to electricity. First of all, I mean, and mostly because they are afraid of, of the gas industry. And you, you can often hear that the, gas in, that, that the biogas that biogas is a Trojan horse of the gas industry. I never hear someone saying uh, wind power is a Trojan horse of the coal industry. To some extent it is, and a Trojan horse of the, of, of the nuclear industry. I mean, if you push for these new productions, while not advocating for, for strong sufficiency and efficiency, that means you, you are still in an addition pattern and not a substitution one. So you're using this as a Trojan horse to keep your nuclear power, coal power, gas industry running later. And policymakers are not always um, uh, uh, conscious enough or concerned enough with that kind of problem. I have a question myself, but maybe there is another one. But I, I start with my question. Um, we did not talk much about prices. Okay? About? Prices. Yeah. And the prices of oil, of electricity are rising of gas, a lot, especially of, yeah. in this moment. <laughs> and uh, it's the first time, I think, in French history that uh, 
uh, the EDF CEO and management yeah. are more or less saying the same than trade unions within the company because <laughs> what happens uh, in <clears throat> the last weeks in France is that to avoid an increase in prices, electricity prices of 44% and try, I think, to limit these increases to 20%, they asked EDF, the company, yeah. just to uh, sell uh, their electricity below cost, which means for the, for the company a burden of 8 billion, uh, just of course before the election, and we might uh, think that after the election, whether the uh, taxpayers or the company will have a, a big problem, a big issue yeah. with, with those uh, things. Uh, the same uh, four years ago, or five years ago, the, the um, financial manager of EDF decided to resign because uh, France wanted to go and try to build another uh, EPR, this nuclear reactor in, in, the, in UK. the UK. Yeah. And it said, OK, it's the death of the company. We will, we will not make it and we will just have a huge debt burden. So there is a matter of debt, about, uh, of projects that are implemented, about prices. So uh, in your scenario, uh, do you think that renewable is a kind of solution to, to, to this? I mean, uh, to, to what extent the prices uh, will, will be a kind of lobby, a counter lobby? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> I mean, it in two minutes, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard to answer because I mean, the, uh, the, the situation is so biased in France when it comes to, you know, prices reflecting the uh, economic reality that I mean it's 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 used um, to to argue by all sides and I mean maybe two 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 things I can say first I mean coming back to what I said about EDF and all the uh, 70s stories which we are still stuck with I mean the situation regarding price electricity prices and the burden that is supposedly put on EDF uh, nowadays comes from the fact that in the early 2000s uh, France chose not to open the uh, the uh, electricity generation market um, and um, only uh, the uh, sales market uh, and to keep EDF in a monopolistic situation with its nuclear fleet. And I mean, this led to this uh, so called RN scheme that is uh, of concern with uh, what you just raised, which uh, some years ago was actually uh, uh, providing EDF with an income that was larger than what EDF would get on the market. So there were times when EDF earned a lot of money through that scheme and no it's the opposite but the I mean the main problem is it's the same it's it's a kind of monopolistic disguised uh, framework that prevents the market to uh, operate and prevents EDF from being confronted to a lot of new renewable players coming in which, which would happen right now, or would, hap would have happened in the past years if there was not a scheme. So we, I mean, it, yeah, it's, it's completely absurd. The other point is we, I mean, <coughs> we have a government that, that spends billions in protecting consumers from an increase of prices while first we need an increase of prices especially in the electricity sector because due to the situation uh, this historical situation EDF has been largely under in, in investing in the uh, refurbishment and replacement of the uh, electric uh, uh, of yeah infrastructures in the electric system compared to Germany, for instance, that 
subsidize the high investments in new, um, in, in new, um, in new projects. Uh, so we need an increase of price. And second, I mean, the, 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 same, uh, the same budget, the same tens of billions, because that will be the final bill of uh, the uh, uh, Sheikh Energy and, and so on. I mean, if this had been spent on thermal retrofitting, for instance, in the past years, or just to insensitize, insensitize Incentivize, <laughs> uh, incentivize um, efficiency or even sufficiency uh, for households and, uh, and, and companies. I mean, we would save uh, money through lower energy consumption and we, be, we would be more protected from the effects of higher price on gas and so on. So, we, I mean, the, the, the whole policy over the years has been just absurd. Uh, the government doesn't want to do anything that reduces energy uh, and especially electricity consumption because that would reduce the market for EDF and EDF needs that market to keep reactors running because if they stop reactors, they have to pay for the decommissioning and that would add to the uh, already heavily debt. So it's yeah, a, a, a vicious circle, again, as I said already, that French policymakers just can get out of. Yeah. Thank you very much, Yves.